Yes, I, I, in terms of my current position, I've been there since 2006. In terms of working in Sub-Saharan Africa since 1992. Um, in, in Refugee Law Project, we have built up our work on gender-based violence, on sexual violence, over the last 10 or 13 years. Um, I think if I, w if I want to summarize where, what do we do now, I would say the, the first task is really how do you enable people to talk about what has happened to them. Then it's really about can, can we make a referral for medical support for most cases. And if we can make a medical referral, which is normally dependent on funding, are we able to accompany that person? Um, not necessarily being with them all the time throughout the procedures, but do we work with them and their families before they go to hospital, during their stay in the hospital, and after they come back home? Um, what we find is that after we've done that kind of medical support, that's when people start to want psychosocial support. So, you know, you've, you've worked on my body, what about my head? And so we also provide counselling. And that we start with the survivor, where it's appropriate and the person is comfortable. It may extend also to their spouse, it may extend to their children, siblings, parents, other members of their household. Um, ideally, we, we try to document also the recovery process and we're moving to a situation where once we have worked with somebody on their health needs, on their recovery, that is the point at which we like to take a full testimony of what happened. Because by then we have much more trust, the relationship is much stronger. So we feel that people can tell us much more comprehensively what really happened. Because as you know, there are so many reasons why people don't tell you all the details at the beginning. Our other area of work with refugees uh, is really around voice. So are people able to speak for themselves? Are survivors able to stand up in public and say, this happened to me um, as a way of breaking down stigma, as a way of engaging the attention of policymakers and practitioners? So we do a lot of work on that, including video work and recording people's testimonies on film. Um, and. I, the other element, I think we're coming to that in another question maybe, but is around establishing support groups. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think what, what, one of the things that we're realizing is that gender-based violence, and in particular sexual violence, is a major reason for people to become refugees in the first place. And one of the reasons they become refugees is because of stigma and fear of, of their perpetrators in the country of origin. Um, so we. As I say, as once we've worked with somebody on their initial injuries, um, we try to work with the broader household or family uh, so that they, they don't necessarily feel so excluded from their own family because we find that a big problem. Uh, you know, women who are, who are worried that their husbands will kick them out of the household, equally male survivors who are worried that their wives will walk off with another man. Um, but also working with the broader community so that their own community does not stigmatize them in the way that tends to happen. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the most effective ways we've found of doing that has been to encourage people to come together in support groups and support each other and in the process get uh, more voice and more power to speak back, not just to their own communities, but even to local authorities, to other refugee stakeholders who maybe didn't understand their issues. So we have support groups of uh, many different support groups, including women who have children born out of rape, uh, people living with HIV as a result of sexual violence in conflict, uh, women survivors, we have a support group of several support groups of male survivors as well, um, sexual and gender minorities. So all of those groups function to give a collective voice which makes them better able to stand up for their rights as well. It varies. Some people come to us direct, so we, we have people who walk into the office, they ask to 
they're, they're looking for some kind of help, they may not tell you what it is at the beginning. So some people come self-referred, other people are referred to us through the support groups. So what we have found is that once you have a support group, there are a surprising number of people in each group to not other people who've had a similar experience, but who have not yet come forward and looked for support. So the support groups, are, are they, they become an important peer referral mechanism. Mm -hmm. There are so many obstacles. I think uh, it's, it's, in, it's, it's, it's difficult to prioritize them because they all uh, impact on each other. I think the starting point is around norms of masculinity and femininity and people's assumptions that if, if somebody, if a male is a victim of sexual violence, their masculinity is in question. And that, those assumptions are true both for the survivors themselves and for the organizations that should be supporting them. So very many male survivors do not want to talk about what happened. And if they need to talk, they will tell you about torture. So torture is its an important area, of course, but it's also a problem in terms of understanding how much of that torture actually involved sexual violence. Because nearly all survivors will first talk about torture. So they tortured me, and then only when you've explored for some time what was that torture about, you realize it involved some kind of sexual violence. I think uh, we have a problem with the, the mainstream, what I call the mainstream, but the dominant narrative um, that has been established within the humanitarian sector, within the aid sectors, um, which is that gender-based violence is about women, uh, women as victims, men as perpetrators. So that narrative, again, has become an obstacle to men coming forward. There, it's very difficult, for example, to find an office even that has a poster which shows an image of a man in need of assistance. You'll find plenty of posters showing a woman and virtually none of a man. And so the signals that we send out as humanitarians about who are we concerned about are quite the wrong signals in terms of helping men to come forward and say what has happened to them. But even if they do come forward, it's not just the humanitarians. The whole system has become geared in that direction. So the programming is not there for male survivors, by and large. We're still, even after 10 years, we're still one of the only organizations in the whole world that is actually specifically working with men, as well as working with women. We work with more women than with men, but we have particular programming for men. And we're still one of the only ones. I think there are three answers to that question, and they're all important. The first one is that we're a human rights organization. We're not a women's rights organization, we're not a men's rights organization. We're a rights organization, and we believe that all human beings have rights, including rights to access adequate medical care, the right to bodily integrity, the right to protection. So we will not discriminate on the basis of gender, or sexuality, or gender identity for gender minorities. So for us, it's about human rights. Secondly, to the extent that we're engaged in humanitarian operations, we believe the humanitarian imperative is to help people in need. Again, without discrimination. It's the humanitarian imperative does not say help women in need or help men in need. It says help people who have a need as a result of this crisis. And the third one is that we actually see very many connections between what happens to men and what happens to women. And we find that if you only work on one half of that equation, that half actually suffers further. So if you only work with women and you ignore men who have similar experiences, similar impacts, it causes a lot of problems between the women and the men. So in the interests of helping both women and helping men, you need to work with both sides of that gender binary. So those are the real reasons why we, we work with men as well as working with women. And as I say, we work with both. Mm -hmm.